Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Control Up Community Radio. We have a great episode for you today, the last episode of 2023. And we're going to end off with a bang, and I'm really, really looking forward to this. We have the amazing Steve Greenberg, and I've known Steve since the 90s. I met him on this thing called The Thin List, and you you might have heard about this thing. It's it's the first community, really, in the whole Citrix world. It wasn't called EUC. It was just called Citrix back then. And this is when I met Steve, and he had a company called Thin Client Computing based in Phoenix, Arizona. And since then... He still has thin client computing. He's been doing and in, in innovating for all those years. And, uh, but he's also started up something called the EUC Unplugged, formerly called Master's Retreat. It's an amazing event held in Phoenix each year. And we're going to talk a bit about that. We're going to talk about EUC. We're going to talk about the changing world. We're going to talk about tons of stuff. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode as much as I do. I love Steve. He's a great guy, extremely talented, extremely smart, CTP fellow, easy for me to say, very difficult to earn. And he's one of them. So with no further ado, here's my interview with Steven Greenberg from Thin Client Computing. Okay, Steve, thanks so much for doing this with me. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, I've had you on a few DABCC radio podcasts, but those are years ago and so much has changed over the years. So, you know, when I started to put together, you know, control up community radio and thinking, who do I want to some of my first guests? One of the first person that came to mind was you. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this with me. Well, thank you, Doug. It's a pleasure. And we have a long history and I'm going to randomly jump around, but one comes to mind because you tell great stories and I remember them and I use them. But one of the great stories you told years ago, I remember sitting in a car with you when you were my Citrix engineer <laughs> a million years ago. I and um, you were talking about, and I'll probably butcher it, but you can correct it. You were talking about one of your early jobs in IT and how you were so proud of the job you did on, on a customer site or a client site. And, and, and your mentor was saying, it's, that's great, Doug, but if people don't know what you did, it doesn't matter. That's correct. That's correct. And it's, but did I get the story right? Yeah, it's, it's, we were actually, it's, it's, you know, a methodology in a box. The intro to that methodology in a box was written for that conversation. It was a thank you to that man. And the book oh, okay. opens with that story. And the story is we're sitting in a bar in Northwest Iowa, having a drink, you know, small little town of, you know, a couple hundred people having a drink or many drinks. And he looks at me and says, Doug, you're a good engineer. You can build a great network. But if the end users don't perceive it's a great network, you will never be a great engineer. I look back at the guy. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, dude? I'm the best of the best because we're drinking, right? And he's like, no, 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 no. Let's be serious here. You know, I'm going to teach you about perception. I'm going to teach you how to actually do the job, not just click next and, you know, make things look and shine right. And it changed my life. It It was the beginning of, really learning so much and that was that was it yeah you're right i'm surprised you remember that that's really cool and i remember from you telling it to me i forgot it was project methodology in a box's intro too but that influenced me on my whole career i take little gems and i apply them and that's something that's been a real core of my practice i'm always trying to be relatable and make the client or the organization part of the solution part of the excitement and understand why and understand them and little things like that stick with you, you know? And so I just wanted to share that with you. That's interesting. That's really cool. I'm, I'm glad you remember that. That's, uh, you know, I was just in Dublin. I wrote an article on LinkedIn a while ago about this. And, but I just, I was in Dublin a few weeks ago and, and I did a presentation on 12 things that I learned in my career that changed my life. And one of them was that. Because if you That's think great. about it, there's so many things that someone says to you as a flippant comment, maybe, or maybe a very serious thing where they say, like, Steve, l- listen to me, I need to teach you something. Or just it's a joke, but that joke resonates with you, right? Exactly. And, and it sticks with you and it changes you. And I have a bunch of, you know, you remember good old Arlo Pranos. That guy was filled oh, with lessons, yeah. right? I learned That's so awesome. many things from him. And then I want to jump to the present because your timing to ask me to do this was so perfect because maybe like as recent as two weeks ago i was getting bored with euc there's like all these huge companies just buy everything up and it's getting so corporate and community programs go away and then certain things just started to take shape and one of the precipitating events was amazon announcing they're releasing an enterprise thin client yeah and i just got re-energized and excited i'm like we're in the next era because Amazon was a book company when you and I had that conversation in the car, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Matrix was the industry. And now it's all these years later and companies have evolved and become mega companies and they have an interest in end user computing. Their, their workspaces presence is significant. They're a player. It's totally changed and it's fun and exciting again. So I thought the timing was great to talk about some of these things. That, that's really interesting. You know, in, in Amazon being a book company that got into EUC is another thing that I, I, I picked up as a you know youngster was that every company or not everything, but yeah, everything has a byproduct. And so like the story originally was told is that the wood company, you know, the company would cut down trees uh, to create wood to sell for houses when they're, you know, industrializing and building out America had all this sawdust and to them, it was trash. And they're like, what do we do? So they tried to give it away for free. They burned it, you know, whatever. It was just like, we have too much sawdust. So someone came up with the brilliant idea is let's sell it for like mulch and for pretty sidewalk displays, you know, for underneath your bushes. And, and now they actually make more money selling the mulch than they did selling the wood. And so, well, and that and, and that that direct analogy to Amazon is apparently, yeah. from everything I can tell, they make their money from AWS and not from retail. Interesting, I did not know that, but they got into oh, yeah. AWS. Yeah, in fact, Amazon, Amazon has server. lost money on the retail division for most of its life, and even Interesting. in recent years. Interesting, yeah, I did yeah. not know that. If you have Kevin Goodman on or have a conversation with him, he follows these things very, very closely. This is even before he worked there. But yes, it's very interesting. So that sawdust thing is very relevant to Amazon and EUC. It's probably yeah. one of the reasons that they're making that investment in a thin client because this area is profitable and there's a market and there's a need. So that's really cool. Well, I love the idea of a thin client. I mean, you know, I, I started off on mainframe. So the idea that, or when I was introduced to Citrix, one of the first things I said to myself was, where's my dumb terminal? Right. So now Amazon to have right. an entire stack where it's like, okay, we can do the entire thing, buy this box, turn it on. It's the Apple TV. It's the, it's the desktop. Oh, darn it. How am I drawing a blank with Mark's video, the virtual workplace? You know, oh, yeah. It's That's really something stuff. else. That, that, was that 2001? 2001. You got it. That was, was that really, crazy? really something else. Yeah. It, it, that, that's, we, we should talk about that a bit too. You know, it's funny though. You say the dumb terminal. When I started using Citrix, it was character based. I first deployed it to do DOS accounting apps that were running on Novell to non Windows machines. And I actually wired terminal connections to the back of other computers so they could pop a window open. And so that, so Citrix actually was character based when it started. But that's a very interesting arc to talk about, which is it started with character based. So it was like modem speeds, right? You know, yeah, thousands yeah, yeah. of bits per second. And now, an endpoint, we, we take this for granted because it happens so slowly, but we're all using like two and 4K monitors and watching high-res videos and incredible graphics and AI. And you think about what is that workload? Just I'm talking endpoint, even if you're hosted, right? That's a lot of freaking data yeah. to be looking at. We, yeah. When we would start on you know VGA resolution and 1024 by 768, the amount of data is a whole different order of magnitude just in what an end user computer wants to see. Well, the codex has got so good over the years and, you know, and you are sending down the deltas, although on a video, there's not a lot of, well, there's probably a lot of deltas still, but, uh, yeah, it is amazing. I, I tell you the biggest thing that surprises me in, you know, in, in Citrix world that you see is 3d graphics. And it doesn't surprise me, but it's the biggest thing that, you know, I saw over the, you know, 25 years that it just blew my mind. You know, it's like, right. wow, right. we can do this because, you know, when we started, you know, you're doing character based, I'm doing, you know, silly little windows three, one apps on NT four, right. Or NT three, five, one on WinFrame, And it's just like, wow, this is possible. That's insane. So now you're following what Benny and Ruben are doing with instrumenting graphics and user experience with high graphics on cloud you follow in their work a, a little bit a little bit I'm, yeah you know I, everybody should look at that because they're just they're just doing amazing work at understanding the differences in protocols but also they've gotten connected to the cam cad industry you know to the guys that do use the really heavy workstations and really do this as yeah. their core work and there's some very interesting lessons coming out of that like the rendering speed doesn't matter to those guys as much as long as they can like rotate the thing and it doesn't delay. Yeah. 
yeah, there's a lot of really cool insights that are happening. I have a couple guys coming on the on the podcast show, uh, El Joe and Ryan, that that oh, yeah. to go EUC stuff, and and which is really you know around around what we're talking about, the performance of the protocols and what have you. And then Benny, I, I chatted with Benny and we're going to do something here. He has some, he's working on some magic. He said in the back end, he said, once I'm ready to talk about it, we'll do it. So that, that should happen the next probably month is my hope. That's wonderful. Everybody should watch what he's doing with Ruben. It's incredible work. Yeah. And he's bringing his scientific method because he is a scientist, you know. Yeah. Early yeah. Early. Yeah. Very thorough about that stuff. And Ruben is, I mean, both those guys are great, great people. Yeah. And also, how cool is it that you're with Control Up? You've had just a really, really interesting career arc, and you've always had this knack for the community side that's incredible. And you do a great job with all of them. And Control Up is just such a cool company. And I consider the Control Up part of this new era. So I said we clicked into a new era. Yeah. So I want to tell you what I'm thinking. The Oh, we can always simplify. They're just metaphors, right? Examples. But I think of if you take the whole history of EUC, the first era, just take it as a whole, was getting up to be able to deliver anything, right? To just the, the ability to do it, to get it to all the devices, the platforms, to handle the kind of things you're talking about. Deltas in, in graphics, 3D, stream video, you know, there's a keyframe and what changes and get all that technology down, the ability to deliver it. But I feel like the next era is about, I don't have a good name for it yet. Maybe we can come up with it on this podcast, but it's a combination of like automating deployment, management, monitoring, optimizing, and taking away a lot of the manualness of this. Cause you know, we're like old world craftsmen, the way we build environments, right? It's, it's all this domain specific knowledge that we've accumulated over decades and we go into environments and you know, do all these crazy registry settings and network things. And I think that era is passing and it's becoming at scale. And so it becomes oh, totally right. generic, right? But now you need the experts that know how to make it all work and work well. And like control up squarely in that, that world of telling you what's going on. And, you know, with the ability to like find a problem and even just trigger actions and things, that's the new era and control up saw it coming. You got it. And, and, uh, and it's also not just about EUC too, as you, as you sort of mentioned, right. Is, is EUC is just a component of it. You know, we used to just live in this little world of deploying apps via Citrix or VMware or Microsoft or whatever. Right. And now it's like, okay, there's laptops out there. There's unified communications that's out there. That's, you know, maybe best being local, you know, it's, it's truly a hybrid world, right? We have some stuff, we have SaaS apps, we have some servers, we own some servers, we don't. You know, it's, it's just, I don't want to use a bad word. I would think include G, but it's not, you know, it's a, it's just a giant mash of, of different services. We have to bring them all together and understand them. Yeah. And the speed of change, the way I describe it is like when I was a Citrix admin originally, I'm talking about, you know, the nineties, we would kind of adopt a product, learn it, live with it for a few years, you know, Novell was the back end then, and you, you have time, you have years, right? And that just keeps compressing. Yeah. And then I got into consulting and we, you know, we do like some stack for two, three years. We got our best practices down, bring it to the next client. Right. And that just kept getting shorter and shorter to Doug. Like one of the reasons I don't even talk about deep tech as much. I like to talk about trends is it's so complicated and changing so fast that literally every project I start, whether it's a short one, a few weeks or a few months, the next one is just completely different. Oh, they don't do that yeah. anymore. Azure, they've changed that methodology of authentication and backend community. It's changing at a rate that's actually beyond really actually human. And you have to just be like completely open, like every day to what's different, what's changed and just not care. Because if you care, you're just going to spend your life frustrated. Well, you, you can't be stuck in your ways. You have to build a solution, right? That's what you've done so well. You don't look at it as a vendor push. You know, you look at it as a, okay, what's your problem? Let's build a solution for you based on what you're trying to accomplish. And you know, it's funny, Consult your sawdust example about the unintended thing. I design for that. I try to go in and really infiltrate an organization and understand the value that they can get that they don't see yet and build it in as well. And I love when that happens, when they come back later and say, you know what, we changed our, whatever, our hiring model or 
you know, we're, we're changing our products because we're able to do this or we're now outsourcing this. I just love seeing the extra benefits that they weren't asking for. You got it. No, hundred percent. And also bringing them along too. And, and, and teaching them about the different, you know, technologies or ideas that can help them solve that problem. Right. And bringing in those technologies. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Very interesting. Very interesting. Steve, you're almost interviewing me. This is truly a conversation. I love it. Well, like I said, we go back a long way. We've had a lot of conversations and in a lot of different roles too, which has been fun. Yeah, it's been an interesting career. You know, uh, Jed told me not long ago, life is not a straight line. And when he, that's one of those things that, you know, someone said to me as, as a, just a simple comment that I just latched onto and I can't get out of my head. And it is, it's, we've, le- you learn so much if you keep your mind open along the way. Right. So, that's so that's it. exactly it. And that's what I'm really enjoying is getting into, you know, you can call it different things. You might call it beginner's mind or warrior's mind. But just putting your brain into a mode where you're just open because it's almost like I was saying things are changing so fast and so deeply. It just the best thing to do is just be completely open. Just take each situation anew. Yeah, you got it. You know, when Steve there's when Steve Jobs gave that famous commencement speech, I love that speech because there's so much to learn in his three simple stories. But he ends with stay young, stay foolish. And that doesn't mean, you know, be a young idiot. And what it means is, you know, keep that young mind to you and, you know, try things that you wouldn't try like a child does. Right. And if you think about it, the perfect analogy is Einstein, right? We know that Einstein was a genius, but when he created, you know, as he, as he got older, he actually became less productive. Why? Because he started believing himself. He started falling into his rules. Right. But when he was, Yeah, it's interesting. But when he created special theory of relativity, what did he do? He broke Newton's laws of physics. Who would do that? Nobody. They were laws. They weren't, you know, ideas. They were laws. It wasn't, you know, it was just, it was stone. Right. And that's, I never, I never heard that or thought that's amazing. So when he was younger, he imagined riding along with a light particle (laughs) and what would happen and figured out the math to tell you that's incredible. Oh, I mean, you learn the more I learn about him, which I don't understand along the way, but I pick up tiny little bits that make me feel intelligent. And then I realized that I got 1% of our 0.1%. And then I realized how stupid I am. <laughs> well, you know, but this it's, whole foolish thing, I actually take this foolish thing to heart. I never heard it said that way, but I do what you're saying. And one example was when we created the, which is now EUC Unplugged, it was the EUC Master's Retreat. It's actually the Citrix Master's Retreat the first couple of years. We had a great user group. I started this, the Phoenix Citrix user group. And, and, you know, when it was new, it was big and growing and exciting. And one of the guys, Barry Flickinger said, you know, these meetings are so good. Why don't we do a whole weekend retreat? And of course, foolishly, I'm like, sure, I'll do that. And this is an important lesson in life. You follow something that just seems right, even if it seems foolish. And in a hundred ways, I couldn't have predicted it turns out to be perfect. And I think one of the greatest examples is right now, I was just saying so many vendors have gone away with such huge consolidation and movement of IT resources being with the giant companies, right? And even Citrix just changed their community model, pulled back quite a bit to be centralized and, you know, internal. And and now we've got this cool conference. You got it. I want to talk about the CGC with you because, but before that, I want to talk, let's dive into this, into your master's retreat slash EUC unplugged. And, and you have a very interesting, a different mindset on building a a conference. And maybe you can explain the history behind it, how it evolved or what you have today, because I really, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's a whole different, it's different. Okay. So early in the 2000s, I was doing, because I'm just such a nerd, I was doing power studies of thin client devices just to see, like, how much power do they use and what's the impact? And at that point, you know, the interwebs was growing and Amazon was this upstart. And there was a totally valid concern about the current growth trajectory of data centers and their level of efficiency. We've run out of power. This was a reality. And I was studying it and trying to figure out, I was hanging out with Krista Anderson. She'd fly in and we'd geek out and test things and write papers. 
And some people in the academic and utility industry and data center industry took note of it and invited me to an event in, I think it was Santa Clara, somewhere out there. And anyway, uh, the long short of it was they assembled all of the experts and everything related to data centers and power and put them in a room and used a method of unconference, open space technology, where you, you, you cast the challenge and everyone self-organizes. And I was like the dumbest person in the room. So it tells you what that room was from, you know, universities, you know, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, all these people, C CFOs, CTOs of power companies, data center builders. And they just gave us a weekend to solve the problem of running out of power in data centers. And I watched this thing unfold where if you just trusted the experts, they could self-organize and create something much greater than you could have programmed. And that's the short version. It created a document which entirely changed the design of data centers, UPSs, power conversion, power supplies, and, and brought them the whole thing to such a high level of efficiency, we averted that situation of running out of enough power for data centers. And that was like stuck with me, like, man, how could this happen? And then as I would attend these conferences and I would speak at many of them, so oftentimes do multiple presentations, I tried everything. I worked on presentations like brute force early on. I was trying different methods of graphic speaking. You always had a fantastic style of a bazillion slides and you just talk and they change behind you, right? I always liked that. I tried all these different things. I went to conferences and I loved it. I had a great run, but I started to feel like the conferences were dictating too much because the best time was always when you ran into someone and you're like, Doug, oh, whoa, what, hold on a second. I got to talk to you. Did you see this? And, we're, and, we're, and we want to get, we want to talk, but we have to get to the next, you know, session, right? It's programmed. Oh, I'm supposed to be over here. And it took away from that interaction. So based on this experience with the data center, Sheree is what they called it, a, a meeting of the minds and some other experiences, I just decided to create a conference where all experienced and mature enough to kind of self-organize. And you bring the people into the room and you get what's current. We're all presenting other places. We're all working. We don't have to necessarily decide six months ahead of time, here's the topic, make a PowerPoint. We're all walking around with laptops full of stuff. We're looking around with all my customer documents, my designs, everything I'm working on. And we look to stimulate that in real time. Now it's not chaos because there's a lot of structure around it, but you let the content find its own you know, self. So you yeah. may want to learn, like I, I asked Benny and Ruben come because I was just dying to sit in the room and have them go through this research they're doing, right? So that one was like, we kind of planned that ahead of time. But other ones are, how are you dealing with the following? And four or five people who are the leaders in that niche or technology or solution or solved it, will just raise their hand and we'll form a session around it. And then we don't limit the time. So we arrange it so there's no one in the room after you. So if this topic, because we've seen this over and over, if 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 you allocate an hour, but it's really important and it's pressing and people are interested, we've seen them go three, three and a half hours. So we just let that happen. Doesn't matter. Move the next one or, you know, move it around. And this flexibility and openness just creates insane results. The level of connection you make with people, the level of technical stuff that you can get to is much greater because you're free to take the time. Then we throw in things like going out and riding e-bikes or hiking Camelback Mountain in Scottsdale or kayaking, things like that. And then we help you change brain modes, right? You might be geeking out on something and you go, let's climb Camelback. Now you're making your body work, but you're still with your geek buddies, right? So you're going up Camelback Mountain and the, and the conversation continues and it's now changed by the experience. I'm just kind of taking random examples, but it's it's... Friday, Saturday, and Sunday like this, where you're just having new experiences and connections the whole time. You've been there. So does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the other thing I'd like you to explain too is, you know, you said, you know, you, you sort of, the, the, the topics surface themselves and then from there it's organized, but you don't start off with an agenda. Can you explain that process? Because I find that really in interesting. 
Yeah. So we, we have, you know, the meal times, right? When the sessions are, where, where they can be. And we do pre-populate certain things. Um, I'll, I'll do a keynote kind of casting a vision or, you know, some current topics, right? Or things of concern or what's happening with people like coming out of COVID. That was a, a big thing of dealing with that. But the, the content of most of the sessions will be formed. And what we call the kickoff is the open space circle. So we literally assemble in a circle, lateral, no top-down structure, and you just get up and pitch your ideas. And they either land or don't, and they often organize into, you know, like joint ideas. Like someone will say, come up and say, you know, something, I'll just make something up random, like, you know, all the vendors are trying to push us to cloud, but most of my clients have these on-prem loads that really can't move. How do you guys deal with hybrid? You know, and They'll say, that's a great topic. And then two other people who are on projects doing it right now will join your discussion and form a session. That's kind of the basic idea. Yeah, I love it. Because what you end up to is not just somebody preaching to you, but a conversation across the, that entire room where, you know, because I think there's, how do I say this? There's a lot of credibility given to a few people, but there's these other guys that we might not know that might not have spoke, but have immense amount of uh, knowledge and experience. And they come to this and then they start sharing. You're like, wait a second. I just learned from someone I've never met before that wasn't planning to present to me. And then that the guy that, you know, been there for years, he adds, and then another person adds. So it, it creates something bigger than the sum of its parts right there live in front of you. Which is That's really a good neat. description. The other thing is the guy in your example might not be super comfortable signing up for a Correct. session or even Correct. getting up and presenting. So you may end up having that conversation at dinner or on a hike or just on some of the downtime that we provide. We have yeah. a lot of like we do like little like maker space. Like we had a couple of years we had like bling your badge. You could add electronics to your badge and light them up and do stuff. And then so you're sitting there and you're distracting your brain. And then that very guy who wouldn't get up and give a presentation just goes, Doug, I know you're interested in this. And then all of a sudden you make a lifelong friend and you learn something you never would have learned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why I attend. I'm not there per se for the, the low level tech. I'm there to meet these people, hear what they have to say, you know, uh, and, and then it grows my broader knowledge. And that's the piece I love, the networking. Now, the crazy here. part, Doug, is because we open it, we've had some real surprises. Like, yeah. A couple ago, my sister came, who's an expert in nutrition and fitness and aging and diet and so forth. And, you know, I just invited her to come because it's a relevant topic. And she had a new book out and she, she totally got the format and she was sitting there during the open space circle and just said, Hey, I'm not a tech person, but I don't understand hacking. I keep hearing about hacking and cybercrime and, you know, can someone teach me about it? So Patrick Coble stands up, suggests a session and it was our number one you know, most popular session, totally unplanned. Yeah. My wife attended that and I yeah. had to listen to it for months on end. So thank you very <laughs> not much. <laughs> well, your wife's awesome. She gets it too. Oh, speaking of spouses, we've also had some of the most popular session be provided by spouses who came. So a few years ago, one of the earlier ones, Robin Zeno came with Jeff Zeno and she just heard the open space thing and wasn't shy and said, I'm a real estate agent. Would anybody like to know how to buy their first house if you've never bought a house? 12 people showed up and thanked me profusely after the conference because they really That's needed cool. that. That's cool. You know? That's cool. You know, in one of the sessions, we can sort of change subjects a little bit, but segue perfectly. One of the ones we did was last year, Rimco had an idea. I think it was Rimco had an idea to do a community round table, you know, around, you know, round circle. And that was really interesting. And I, I Remco said, Doug, you got to attend. So I attended and I just shut my mouth the entire time and listened to all these CGC leads talk. And it was a real eye opener to me because what they wow. were doing is, yeah, what they were doing is somewhat complaining about their limitations and what they could do and what they couldn't do and what they wish they could do and things like that. And at the very end, I sort of said, okay, I, I have some questions. And what I realized was that Citrix built this amazing infrastructure to get a message out, to share resources, to share knowledge, but they didn't leverage it properly. And it was really eye opener for me. One, I love the format because everyone, it wasn't just one guy presenting, but it was all these people sharing their, their, their problems, recommending solutions 
right? And then and then all you know taken away. And and when I first heard the news about CUGC, the first thing I thought was, I wonder because Chris Fleck was there. I wonder if bringing it in house is to solve a lot of what was surfaced in that roundtable. Well, that's really interesting. That's a good positive spin on it. Well, it it could be one of two things, or just kill it off and go for the you know private equity playbook, which is you know no who cares about anybody except the big companies, and we'll send SEs out there, but well, which well, which will show us. But yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. With such things, because they have so many great people who are long timers, yeah, who, who understand the value and the greatness of Citrix, and and are still there, you know, doing it. And yeah. then you've all, like you said, you've got this private equity you know, cloud software group. So I don't have a full read. I think it's probably like a lot of other companies that split brain. You know, there's people with yeah. both. Yeah, you're right. Right. But my basic observation is that these things ebb and flow anyway, because I've seen you, you and I have been around a long time there before. Actually, you were a big pioneer in breaking through in this, but before you could blog and freely speak, there wasn't any openness at conferences. Like I remember taking some of my case studies to like I forums, Mayo Clinic and other people, and they wouldn't let me speak or even be acknowledged as having worked on it or designed it or deployed it. They only the customer could speak and only in that case, Citrix could speak, but all the conferences were like that. And we blew it wide open with geek speak and, and a lot of this nerdy stuff that we kind of pushed our way into. Yeah. And, and I've seen it ebb and flow. Like, corporations will allow it because they start to see value and they see, oh, you know, we're getting more attention. It's going well. And then management shifts and then they clamp it down. Who are these nerds? Why are they out there talking? Why are they criticizing us? Not realizing that the criticism draws attention and makes things better. Well, it's also pure love trying to help the company grow. You know, it's, it's, you know, the best thing you can do is I I was asked this inside the IGEL community when we first started this is what happens if someone says something wrong? What happens if they start criticizing it? And I said, great, we listen. And they looked at me with just a dumbfounded look, like, what do you mean? I was like, we listen, we learn, we fix it. These are our customers. We're building for them. Learn from them, you know? And and they're like, wow, you get that, you know, you're, yeah, you're the leader of the choir, but then you get a change in management and, and, you know, some generic corporation, and then they don't get that and they shut it down. And all I'm saying is it ebbs and flows. And I think we're I just ebbing and flowing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. You know, we'll find out. Like I said, it's one, it's one or the other. But I, I, I have a, a really good feeling that, that, you know, it's, hey, let's bring this in house. Let's, it doesn't take, I was one guy at IGEL. For many years until I finally got Sebastian to work with me that built a community of 9,000 people that shared, you know, 600,000 messages, you know, in, in five years. And that's a huge one guy, that's right? Incredible. And later two guys, yeah. right? In volunteers, of course, but that's what CUGC is. It's, it's, it's uh, in a worldwide organization of the best talent there is as leaders as CGC members, as attendees of the, of the, uh, the events, as people that want to share and give and take. Right. And so if you just bring that in house and empower them, you could really do something amazing. And I think that what CG was missing was that amazing because I think it was clamped and it was like, no, this is how we do it, but no, it's not how we do it. It's how they do it. You know what I mean? Them being the I members. do. I, you're exactly right. It's and exactly what your me... conference is. Your conference is not how Steve does it. Your conference is day one. We have no agenda. You, what do you want? Right. And then exactly. you build that. Exactly. And you can trust it because the people that are coming are the best of the best. So right. it's not going to be. Yeah. Hey, you know what? That reminds me. I want to take a moment for anybody who listens to this that is part or was part of CUGC, especially if you were a leader. I just want to say thank you to you. So many of you, dozens, maybe hundreds of leaders are out there and they're working their butts off and they do this passionately and have held meetings and I've done many of them myself. I started the Phoenix Metro and it's thankless work. It's hard work. It's a lot of your free time. And I just want to shout out to all of you and say thank you because it's been an incredible run, an incredible few years. Yes, there were limitations that based by corporate, but the everybody who stepped up and participated across the country, across the world has done an amazing job and it ain't over yet. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I second that. And, and, you know, and then some, right, you know, you're exactly correct. They did an amazing job. And I hope my hope is, and my belief is that they, they want to do it better and they have the people they have the goods just empower them. And I think that they could, you know, continue to the, the path that they went down and, and make it even better for every single person. I love it. So let's yeah, see, absolutely. let's see. They, they have the potential for it. It's up to them, right? That's right. And it'll happen. Yeah, so this is I think so. Long. I honestly do. Now, the other thing yeah. is, having said that, COVID changed it, too. This isn't just a corporate move. Correct. You know, attendance was down, interest was changing, things were shifting. That's what I was saying earlier. Things change fast. You can have an incredible program, and then it's just thing, conditions have changed. That's why I love what you're doing, because you, you kind of just keep going. You know, like, well, I, I believe in the, I believe in, uh, in person is part of it in, in 2024, uh, we'll the control up. We'll start doing more in-person events, but we'll partner with other people to do them. At least that's my philosophy is, you know, the, the, some of it's, you know, bring in a bunch of people and create something bigger than the sum of its parts, right? Create mini yep. XLs, so to speak. But we started with, let's not, a, you know, a help 10 people or 50 people or even a hundred people. Let's go after thousands of people. Let's enable anybody that wants to learn, share and grow together. Right. And that's my philosophy is that online, because I can hit it any, any, any. You know, it's like I'm going back full circle, my friend, back to the any, 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 you know, you could do yeah, that right. in community too, <laughs> you know, it's like, let's yeah. virtual is not a bad way to live. It's on my phone with me 24 seven. And my favorite part of the IGL community was people were sending messages on Christmas. I was like, you guys need to get a life. <laughs> you know, but it was their life because they loved what they were doing. And I love them for that. Right. We became a, a, you know, little mini family. Right. You know, that's really important. What you just said, like if that person is thinking about the community on Christmas and wants to post, that's freaking awesome. Isn't it? You know, though? We can't say get a life, but that makes them happy. And it makes me happy. I'm freaking hey, happy. I was responding. So, you know, but we were, <laughs> exactly. it was our life. This is, you know, we found a place for us. And I think that you don't need to have to do that in person. It's, it's, it's good to do it in person. There's nothing better than seeing you in, you know, in person and seeing you, you know, and having that, you know, in person meeting people, you don't know, getting to know that, you know, they're, they're just normal people, you know, they're not just some faceless name behind a text message. Right. But you, well, you hit but, on something really important, Doug, which started probably with the creation of the early CTP program, is we are unique animals. And, and because of what you're saying, online, internet, you know, electronic platform, we have found each other across the world. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I can go almost anywhere in the world, uh, minus Asia, which I've never been actually, uh, but almost every place I go, I know somebody. You know, I walk into a room and I'm like, oh man, so nice to see you. And, oh, Doug, so nice to see you. Or it's so nice to meet you for the first time, right? But I've known right. you for I've 10 years. I've seen your blogs. Yeah. I've yeah. Seen or you I've, exactly. I've, we've chatted, but never met in person, right? Dude, it's, you know a, it's a you global that world. Down, though, I'm sorry. I have to go back here because we can't leave out Asia. I think you and I need to do a tour of Asia. No, I would love to go. I would love to go. I've never, never had the, uh, the chance to go. It's just, you know, my wife and I get the question quite often, where are you going for a vacation? Well, our life is a vacation, right? We do our jobs we love. We go to conferences, which we love, you know, with people that are our friends, you know, for vacation, we just want to stay home and do nothing. <laughs> I was just having that same conversation with my wife last night. That's totally us right there. The, 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 the treat is to be home without a lot of commitments Yeah, and be able to see your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. No, I love going to, you know, your event. We always come in a few days early, go check out. We did Sed Sedona last time. I think this time we're going to come in, you know, a little bit early and do Flagstaff. So, oh, great. Uh, yeah. Great. So it's always, you know, we try to butt, butt them around these trips. And Christine, of course, always comes with because she loves, a, I always say she loves it more than I do, which is weird. <laughs> She is awesome. She's such an enthusiastic participant. I love that. She is very <laughs> enthusiastic. I'll give her that. Enthusiasm. You should do a session enthusiasm. next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How? What's it like to live with Doug? Is that the? That's the. That's what everyone says. Is I don't know if do we have session. enough time for that. That could take the whole weekend. <laughs> well, you said it never ends. Like a thing. What with the, the conference is ex extending to a week. <laughs> so uh, I'll be afraid. <laughs> We've changed the seven days. Okay, but here's something I want to throw out there, and I think you. Thought I was kidding. Yeah. But you have a passion for music and vinyl. 
And part of what we want to incorporate into the event is, is passion, right? The things I've learned from doing cryptocurrency or my music studio, they just inform everything else I do. And I really want to set up a vinyl listening lounge and have Doug do a session on great, great vinyl albums. You know, it's a vinyl is really interesting. Christine, my wife has gotten into it also because there's a science behind it, right? So the techie mind, the, you know, the nerdy mind gets into it. It's not just about the music, but when we buy vinyl records, we're actually looking who cut the record, who mastered the record. Why you would never exactly. think this, you know what I mean? It's all, oh, that's a Bernie Grumman. Oh, that's a Kevin Gray. Okay. We'll get this one. Not this, you know, <laughs> it's like, that's nuts. Right. But it's not nuts. So yeah, there's a science behind it, which is actually pretty cool, but it is a rat hole you go down to. I just saw a tweet. I have two Twitter accounts. One is just a vinyl Twitter account. And someone posted, he said, I'm not addicted to alcohol or drugs or, or bags or, or, you know, shoes. I'm addicted to buying too many vinyl records. <laughs> and I replied back, me too, me too. But so, Doug, I'm a musician, composer, and an audio guy. Before I was an IT engineer, I was an audio engineer. And it's this amazing fact that this older analog crude technology of scratching grooves into a piece of vinyl elicits such a reaction, such a positive experience. It's mind-blowing. It's an experience. You said the word. Christine says it, too. It's an experience. And with the experience from... Uh, figuring out what you want to going to a record store and flipping through and be like, Oh, I found it. Oh no, that's not the pressing I want. Oh, Oh, I found this. Oh, great. I'll go buy. And then taking it home and, and cleaning it because you don't just put it on dirty. Heaven help you, you know, cleaning it and then sticking it, you know, I, everything goes into archival sleeves and all this stuff. And then, and then cleaning your needle and putting it on the table and then getting up and flipping. It's an experience, you know, it's and a tactile too. Uh, you get no thrill from downloading a record, you know, a song from iTunes, you know, but you get a thrill taking that record home with you. Be like, oh, I just found this. I can't believe I found this. And you just invested time and energy. So when you sit down to listen to it, you value it. When you just yeah. stream it and you just kind of click through like, okay, that's, what's next? Correct. But now you get to sit down and listen to this thing you invested your time in. Yeah. And that's the same thing with community too, right? It's, it's, you're, it's spending that time with these people and you're learning about these people and, and you're growing together and it's, it's, you get an experience and life is about experiences. No one dies going, gee, I wish I had less experiences unless they were bad experiences, but you know what I mean? It's, okay. it's, it, I do love it. I, I really do. And, and, and if I was filthy rich, I would open up a record sh store, but I would only sell one record. It'd be like David Hasselhoff. It'd be like A, B, C, D, E, F, and it would just be the same record, like a 10,000 copies. And the person would be like, wait a second, do you have anything else? Said, yeah, we got some ABBA. Where in the A's? Well, just Hasselhoff. Oh, huh. Okay, like well, now popcorn? that you live there, I, I just want to know, I just want to know if, is, I want you to confirm the rumor either way. Is it true that he's big in Germany? So it's the first question I asked my my girlfriend that's not my wife. It's it's one of the first questions I asked her. We were somewhere together and I said I looked at her and I said, Is it true that Germans love David Hasselhoff? And I wish you could see me because her eyes sort of rolled up and get this guilty smirk on her face. She goes, Well, I had a picture of him on my wall. <laughs> and laughed. And if it's like true, crazy, it's true. It's totally true, hundred percent true. And and you got the street performers because I live here in Berlin, and so you have the street performers, right? And and we were walking every every now and then we'll walk around and we you know, we hear them all the time. But every now and then someone will be playing Hasselhoff, and she will always be like, "Lily, we need to stop and listen. It's Hasselhoff, <laughs> crazy for you, crazy for me." You know, it's like, oh my god, oh my god. Wow. So yeah, they wow. love them. They love them. They absolutely, it is true. They love them. So I just want to make an observation here, Doug, that this is just a great example of our community. We've known each other a long time. We're talking trends, tech, industry, but we also talk about passions and personal interests and your wife. And that's what it's all about, right? Is relationships that's exactly and experience. Right. That's what community is about. And, and every, I've built two communities now and both of them has chit chat channels and that's my favorite channel. Uh, well, I like the beta channel a lot too, but my, my, you know, I love to chit chat. And if, if you can get a not lively one, it's difficult, you know, because people are busy, you know, but you know, those are the favorite, my favorite one, because you can learn from each other, you know, learn so much that is just, you know, completely off topic, 
but something that int- you know that might be a connection there that you go down that rat hole and you know and yeah i mean my wife loves records now and that's because of me you know and so yeah that's yeah so what cool. do you say yeah it's really so neat. can we can we do it can we have a vinyl lounge if you want to, yeah, we could possibly do that. I know, I know, it's hard for you to bring stuff because you're traveling. We would, we would plan to, you know, I'll be buying records. So Phoenix, Phoenix says, I'll give tell you a guilty little secret, is I definitely wanted to attend your event, but when I when I thought to myself, oh, okay, let's attend the event, I was like, oh yeah, the in groove is there too. I was like, yes, so we're definitely attending. So <laughs> one of the best record stores in America is red uh, is owned by a guy named Mike and it's in Phoenix. And what's so funny is we went there and we watch his videos because he is on YouTube and he has videos every Thursday with the, the new announcement or the new records. And, and he said, Hey, next week I'm going to be gone. And my wife just flipped out. She's like, Oh no, you can't be gone. We need to, we need to meet him. So we looked up to see when the conference he was going to. Oh, it's Thursday, Friday. Okay, well, if we go on Monday morning, he'll be there. <laughs> so we get there on Monday morning, and she stalks him, finally talks to him. Next thing you know, and we had a half an hour conversation with the man and pictures taken. And, and she was just like, oh, we met him. We met him. So, That's so awesome. So now, like, did he have any Hasselhoff records in the store? Uh, we didn't look. That and the, she loves the Backstreet Boys, too. So that's uh, he's he's jazz and, and stuff like that. So I, I didn't ask him about that. You got any Hasselhoff in there? We don't have to worry about There's plenty in Berlin. <laughs> do, do, do the Germans know the reference to being Hasselhoff when you change someone's screensaver when they leave their desk? Remember that old thing? No, no, I don't remember that. I, oh, I, he was I, that whole way. That was a that was a big thing for years and years. Is if someone didn't like lock their screen, you put the David Hasselhoff on their background or their screensaver. Oh, interesting, interesting. I didn't. Well, Hasselhoff. we used to. I remember when I was a consultant, we worked with this guy Dave Garrison, and and Dave was super awesome man. And and but we would mess with this poor guy. So we would. Do you remember the TSR that you could? That would like uh, you push a key and it turned into a blue screen. Yeah. TS. Yeah. So, Terminate, yes. stay resident. Yep. Yeah, yep. exactly. TSR. So, uh, <laughs> and so we did that. He's like, oh my God, it's a blue screen. And then we'd all laugh. <laughs> Damn you. My favorite one is some guy came in with like industrials Velcro and we Velcroed everything on his desk to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, poor Dave. He was such a wonder. I think he passed away and, and I know he did. And when I heard the news, I was quite sad about it. He was a wonderful man that we used to just mess with left and right but he was he was the he enjoyed it too right and we did it out of pure love he was just an absolutely great guy so so so, hey you brought up amazon think client stuff do you want to maybe expand on what's going on over there i think that's an interesting one that a lot of people don't follow maybe not follow amazon and i am intrigued by that yeah i mean think about it think about Amazon as a company, their history, then then the growth of AWS and hosting, and that being like really where they make their most money, as I understand it, by far, like, you know, billions compared to breaking even or small profits. And it's been become a standard. It's been adopted. And they committed to EUC years ago, and they've continued to increase that commitment. They have some of the best minds working there. And the fact that they are releasing endpoint hardware signals a commitment at scale to this segment and i think it's amazing i think it's incredible and really you know deserves a lot of inquiry and study and discussion what does this mean to me it's i'm at the initial stage of you know taking it in and just thinking that that decision obviously carries with it the weight of amazon and their resources And then you look at like the impact on hardware, you know, their ability to develop hardware at scale with Fire and Echo, and that's a different level, right? You know, it's sort of like Apple creating a thin client, right? Yeah, what does that mean? Very interesting. Very interesting. It it, it really is. It's a DAS solution, and and I see a lot of folks. You know, you mentioned it too. This sort of hybrid world. And I'm a big fan of the reason I'm trying to segue into. I'm a big fan of what Parallels is doing. And because of the fact that I hear a lot of people still want on-prem and, or they're doing, you know, desktops or they only want to do a few apps in the, you know, remoting world. And what do you think of that type of, you know, just like going back to the old way of doing quote unquote Citrix, where, you know, you put your line of business apps up there and you seamless windows them down to your existing devices. I think that's, I think that's still a 
killer app. It's one of the things I did day one when I first did Citrix 30 years ago and still do today. I still think it's one of the most killer applications, right? To to identify and isolate a set of data and applications that need, for whatever reason, security, proximity, design, to run together, to be secure and be accessed, and then publish them out. It's still, it's funny. It's like the first thing I ever did, and I still do yeah. it all the time. And I think it's fantastic. It doesn't have to be your whole desktop, right? And that's the, I think the future, especially you mentioned early on how much has gone to SaaS, how much we, you know, we uh, as the integrator or the customer, the client don't own the application anymore. We have to, you have to support all those scenarios. Yeah. And I, I think publishing, you know, line of business applications is one of the strongest use cases. It's interesting because I agree with that, but I'm also old. And so it is the first thing I do believe that, you know, okay, I have my Mac here. I love my Mac. Don't take away my Mac. I'll come after you, you know? Uh, so why don't I just take my line of business apps that, you know, control up makes me use and put those down via a remoting solution, seamless windows type of thing. I don't care if it's, you know, parallel Citrix, Microsoft, I don't care. And, and do it that way. But then you look at, and the reason I sort of segued in this, I'm going to segue back. You look at something like the complete stack, like what Microsoft or Amazon's doing. And if it, Amazon does it, Microsoft can do it. They have a surface. They can easily create an endpoint, or they can pick up a company like a Stratadesk and IGEL, right? A Tenzig right. and make right. that stack too. And at that point, you know, where's the world going? You know, Gartner had their, their, their post or their magic quadrant that said in five years, majority of the companies will be DAS. I was up in Dublin and I'm talking with this great guy from MasterCard Jags. And he said, yep, five years, hundred percent or not hundred percent, but jet, you know, DAS is the solution. So it's sort of, you know, those are two separate worlds. You know, what, what do you think, Steve? There's your big $10 billion question. Yeah, exactly. I think it's 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 all the above, and it's what people need and and want to consume, and they'll do it. It's never going to be one thing. The year of XXX never worked, yeah, right? Exactly. There's never been a way. I think the value of DAS is that it, let's say you're an employer of any kind, your entire workflow can be in the DAS that you provide, right? So that's a super strong use case. I can keep all my crap in one place turn it on, turn it off, deliver it to who needs it. Kind of hard to beat. But at the same time, it's a bit of an inefficient model because we're all carrying supercomputers with us, right? So I think it's going to be all the above and yeah. not for the other. And I also think EUC as a niche ecosystem and industry has to adapt to more use cases. That's something I've actually always done. I never lost sight of like, a PC is awesome. When is it best? When should you have one? When should you combine it, right? And I think that's where we're at. I do think that there's one concept that maybe addresses your question that I think is dismissed too readily it, because it came out super early and Chris Fleck and me and others say were it, running Say out. it, say it. I was we, going there, say it. Nirvana phone. Yes, thank you. The, I'm going to explain to you why it is the future, whether you think so or like it or I not. agree. I agree. And the reason is we're on audio, not video, but I'm holding an iPhone 14 and it's more than powerful enough to do everything I need with great graphics. And when you used to think of Nirvana phone, it was kind of like a special phone or a special screen, but there's HDMI adapters. So it can run everything that we need it to run. And if you want a remote and like you're saying, you use a Mac and your corporate apps or windows that can do that. So I don't think you're going to have really more than one device at some point it'll just be your device and it accesses everything you need and it runs local what it should it runs remote what it should it runs SaaS what it should and you're done yeah i agree i a hundred percent i i don't i think it's going to take time i asked mark templeton this question and he said you know but the and the employees want a desktop they want that laptop it's part of something they get when they join and i was like i agree i was like i told control up i need a 16 inch macbook pro and otherwise i don't join <laughs> you know and they looked at me sort of funny but i totally said that because i wanted it and but in the future you know well what are, it might are, be are, it's, it's it's what you see and touch you might yeah. require some 
awesome monitor like i have this beautiful well this LG is exactly where i was going exactly and yeah. it's like you you i think apple talked about it that they're working with hotels to where you can just go in and immediately you know cast over to the hotel from your iphone and get your you know basically the nirvana phone you know you can get all your apps all your stuff you know or, or watch your movies watch your videos you know check your email exactly. And in that, to me, the Nirvana phone is like the PlayStation memory card where you went to your buddy's house, you popped in the memory card and I had my persona with me, but I don't have to pop in anything because it's all done via Bluetooth wire, you know, NFC, all this stuff, right? Proximity. It's just in my pocket. And now I'm, I'm just sitting down, boom, up comes my thing on the machine. That's already there. The, the dumb. Hey, I'm going to take that. Let, right? What's wrong with that? I think you hit the core of it. It's not that it's your computer, it's your identity and your authentication and your kind of personalization right. that you can and then it interacts with other things to right. bring I've, al I've always thought a great software company would be in or not always but you know the first past really since you know maybe five six seven years is the company that's able to tie everything together into persona so that i can log in and everything is there Think of it like an Uber profile management, exactly. but exactly. across all the boards, you know, all the apps, right. That gives me, this is my memory card, you know, and now it's just connected me in on some other machine securely, of course, you know, and put everything in there and log me in and single sign on and blah, blah, and who, blah, blah. And who, who in the industry do you think has the most of that was the closest to that today? I have someone in mind. I'm curious if you agree. I don't know. I don't know. Apple. Yeah, yeah, for exactly sure. Exactly what Apple you said. Sure. And you don't for think sure. so because it's not corporate ish, but it's identity, it's password vaults, it's payments, yep. it's security, it's hardware security, right? Hardware execution ability, code compatibility, like you know, you can move things between iOS and you know, Mac OS and it be they're actually the closest to it. And they have yeah. a lot like pieces of it today, actually. Yeah, you're hundred percent correct. And it's one reason I can't leave Apple. You know, it's like for a long time we said, okay, let's no wall, wall gardens. Oh, we just walked into the biggest of them. You know, it's now everything's you're in the Google ecosystem or the, but the Apple one is, you know, I got my iPhone and my Apple TV, my Mac, you know, I go to my house in Florida. It's like, I get the same thing set up and it just connects, you know, I don't, and exactly. copy and paste between the two, which I use daily. I love that feature. I also have a real problem with Google because they removed don't be evil from their mission statement. Ah, that's Google's data scientists. Their entire idea is, you know, I mean, that's their that's their DNA, right? Go back to if you want to see what yep. a company is going to do, go to their DNA. Who are they as individuals? Exactly. And I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying who are they as individuals? Microsoft. That's not their DNA. Their DNA is to put a desktop on every computer. That's their DNA, right? right? But right. Google's right. DNA is how can we learn from data? Okay, let's collect the data. You know, Apple's DNA, I don't know, is to make really cool devices. I think they lost that with Cook, but but they're still heading down the path of, you but know. They still understand they want the, they want a delightful user experience. Correct. That's still driving. Correct. A hundred percent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Steve, we better, you know, we wanted to keep this thing not too short, but not too long too. So I think we're heading about, what, about an hour right now, right? So, I think we're there. Yeah. Yeah. We can so do we or pick this up at EUC Unplugged in April 2024. If somebody wants to learn more about, about EUC Unplugged, what do they need to do? Well, as you say these days, go to EUCUnplugged.com. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, it is a small conference. We max it at 100 people, and we are 30% capacity taken. So it is going to sell out. So don't make this one that you stop and think about. It's not a giant conference where you can decide last minute. So that's the only yeah. thing I throw out. And the other thing I love about it too is you pay one fee and that includes the hotel. So uh, the, if you look at the price, the say, oh, yes, everything. So so when you look at the price, don't think, oh, and you know that's everything. That's the one price. You have your hotel room. You're in beautiful Phoenix. The weather's lovely, and you meet some uh, just amazing folks. So I've and every year I've met somebody new, which is really great too. And I saw some old friends that I hadn't seen in 15 years, which last I did last year, Rob. That's working over a day, and I was like, "Oh my god, it's so great to see you!" Isn't that cool? Uh, I love yeah, that part of it. I love it. I love it. Okay, you know what? I actually wrote down some questions, and I love this so much better because we did actually talk about everything I wrote down, but not in any particular order. 
Steve, this has been one of my favorites, and I've done. Well, I consider DABCC. This is like DABCC Radio Part Two, right? So yep. it's like three hundred and fifty some episodes. This is one of my favorites. Thank you so much for taking the time. And, Thank you. I feel the same way, Doug. And to be doing something and be with this industry and ecosystem so long, and it just keeps getting more and more fun and better, is just I can't be grateful enough for it. I think it's I think it's only going to get better. It's going to change drastically. So if you're stuck in your ways, it's not the best time to be. But if you're open-minded, young and foolish, then this is a great time to be in EUC, right? Amen. I second okay. that. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Okay, that concludes another successful episode of Control of Community Radio and our last episode for 2023. Thank you, Stephen, so much for taking the time to do this with me. I love it. I love it. That was a fun conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. And I wish you all a very happy new year. If you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. Yeah, what do I say? Thank you, Stephen. What a way to end a year. What a way to end a year. We're going to have a great episode as episode number one in, or episode number seven or six or whatever for next year, but the first episode of the year. And it's a secret guest I'm really excited about. And you'll all hear on that date. We'll post it probably the 2nd of January. So what do I say? I'm quite excited. Yeah. Happy New Year, everyone. And thank you all for listening to, wait, wait a second. If you like the show, please tell a friend right? Please tell a friend, tell your coworkers, post it on LinkedIn, post it on Twitter. I loved con Control of Community Radio. Great conversation with Steve Greenberg. Doug is awesome. Yeah, I'll leave that part out. Uh, great conversation with Steven. And definitely subscribe to our, our podcast on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Google, on, on YouTube. It's everywhere. So subscribe to us. You'll see it in the show notes. And with that, no further ado, happy new year happy 2023 merry christmas and thank you all for listening to control up community radio happy new year all